My name is Naval. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and investor out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, started companies uh, like Epinions and AngelList, which is the largest platform for online fundraising and startup recruiting. And I'm an investor in seed stage in early companies like Twitter and Uber and Postmates and so on and so forth. Yeah, New Zealand uh, actually has a lot of assets going for it, which are obvious. Obviously, uh, beautiful nature, rule of law, uh, very low corruption, um, English speaking, uh, kind of Western norms, which are useful for doing business because you know a lot of the norms in doing business come from the Western world. Um, and three hour time zone shift from Pacific time on the West Coast of the United States. Um, but it's still small enough and uh, that it can experiment. And so I think there's an opportunity here to run this country as an incubator for systems level experiments with the understand their experiments. They might fail, in which case you shut them down. But uh, you know, if New Zealand were to do, let's say, 20% of the regulatory arbitrage that a Malta does, it would get 10 times the business because people want to live in New Zealand. It's a real country with a real culture and a certain size and scale. Um, if you were to, uh, for example, if you wanted to attract blockchain companies or drone companies or AI companies or self-driving car companies in New Zealand, it wouldn't take that much, right? You could carve out one town and say, this is good for self-driving car experiments. You could take one open area and say, this is good for all the drone experiments. You could take one sector, the financial sector, and say, okay, we're going to let you uh, do crowdfunding properly and raise money for ICOs and so on within, uh, for utility tokens. And we're going to define that very clearly for you. So New Zealand could run these kinds of experiments, these economic experiments, and, and do really well. In a sense, EHF is, is a very radical, but very interesting, low-cost experiment. EHF, in my mind, is very much like a venture-style bet, where for a very small amount of money uh, and a very small number of visas, which is like far less than get issued um, on an annual basis, you run an experiment where you attract the most talented people in the world uh, and you kind of see what happens. Uh, when you look at Silicon Valley or Hollywood, uh, those areas are successful not because they create entrepreneurs or they create actors, it's because they attract entrepreneurs and they attract at actors and actresses. So the successful cities in the United States and successful regions are attractors, they're not creators. And uh, with something like uh, EHF and a global impact visa, um, you're sweating every detail in every single visa uh, and you're setting up an ecosystem to attract people who can then catalyze something larger around them. Um, so I, I view uh, New Zealand as a place to run these kinds of uh, potentially uh, high outcome, low cost experiments, whether it's in immigration, whether it's in uh, cryptocurrency regulation, whether it's in drones or uh, whether it's even in, in ecosystem design, development, rescue, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think if you were to like come up with a list of like the top 10 countries in the world where people would want to live, where they don't already live, New Zealand would make that list every time. Uh, and in fact, it would make that list for a broader set of reasons than some of the other countries that make that list. Like, uh, you know, if, if you ask the random person in the third world, like, what country do you want to go to, <laughs> right? If they say United States, okay, land of opportunity, all that, branding around that. Um, people might, some people might say Switzerland or Singapore, but that's for tax reasons or whatever. Um, if someone's going to Malta, they're doing it for regulatory arbitrage, right? Um, New Zealand is, people would say, livability, right? It's just overall quality of life. I'm hard pressed to think of a place in the world that has higher overall quality of life and well-being. Um, and then New Zealand is kind of a, has the advantage and the disadvantage of being remote, right? Advantage and that that's what protects it. If New Zealand were say on the border of Asia, if it, if it physically shared a land border with Asia, I guarantee you it would look very different. It'd be, the population would be 10 times as large and we wouldn't be talking about immigration or innovation. We'd have the opposite problem. We'd have problems with pollution and, uh, and land use and those kinds of things. Um, so it, it, is, it is a strength that New Zealand is remote, but now thanks to airplanes and the internet, uh, New Zealand can compete and participate in the global economy at a level that I don't think it could have even 20 years ago. Uh, the internet is making remote work much, much easier. It's spreading knowledge and know-how. 
it's spreading trade. Uh, Asia has become such a superpower in terms of markets so that having a place that is accessible to both Asia and to the West is, gives it a very unique position. Literally the only thing that stands between New Zealand uh, and uh, a Singapore, Hong Kong level of economic success without the development because you don't want this place to look like Hong Kong or Singapore, but in terms of the employment rates and the GDP growth and all of that kind of thing, literally the only thing that's standing in the way is just a few little regulatory and immigration changes here and there would do it. Uh, now with airplanes, New Zealand is very accessible and with the internet, uh, you know, you can live here and do almost anything. I think EHF is compelling because it is a, a very unique experiment. Uh, it is the only place in the world where people are being incredibly thoughtful and intentional about who is immigrating to the country and what they're doing in this country, right? Today, if you look at most of the world, um, immigration is sort of this highly politicized battle where we don't want those kinds of people in the country or they're stealing our jobs. Um, or on the flip side, you have too many people tr trying to get into a country and it's based on who crossed the border first or who already has a relative. Uh, and there's no good system to choose. And, and even the systems that are in place, um, for example, the, the, the U.S. has an H-1B visa, which is supposed to be a skilled visa, or they have an O-1 genius visa. And these things get hacked. They get hacked to import a certain kind of labor, and they have template fill-outs and so on. Whereas I see with EHF, you have intentional immigration design. And then the amount of effort that's taken to acclimate us to New Zealand, it's not like, here you are, welcome to New Zealand, go. Right, which is how most immigration works. Instead, it's here are the Maori people, here's the culture and the history, here's what we care about in the environment, here are people who are working in different sectors and, and what they need help with and what they can help you with. The level of integration that's done, it has to be the most thoughtfully designed immigration program in the world. And if it works well, then you could see it scaling up such that literally New Zealand sucks in a crazy amount of talent and creates a template for the rest of the world. So I think in that sense, it is a solution to the immigration problem being incubated. And that is one of the biggest problems in the world today. You've done a really good job of selecting uh, people who are, uh, it, it is a balance of people who have done great things and people who are going to do great things. And obviously, there's no way of telling for sure, but I look at it as a venture portfolio. And you've collected a venture portfolio of a hundred and something people um, of whom 10 are going to do really amazing things, and you can't tell which 10 right now. Um, it's probably not me because I'm over the hill, but you know, for the younger people. And there's going to be one who's going to make a significant impact on New Zealand, or two or three, but it'll be 10 or 15 years from now. But it'll be a nonlinear impact. Um, and I think that uh, that's, a, that's a hard thing to build, to manage a venture portfolio. Um, but when I look at the people, they all have that characteristic. Um, there are social entrepreneurs, there are um, you know, uh, there are uh, classic technology entrepreneurs, um, there are uh, resource lifestyle entrepreneurs. Everyone there is very self-driven, very, very motivated people. Everyone has a story. Everyone has something they're hustling over, something that they're trying to push out there into the world. Uh, they're all creative people. Um, they all have a point of view. So it's, in that sense, it's a very, very impressive group. Um, I think EHF has done as good of a job as it possibly can integrating them in a short period of time. But then they just have to come back more, spend more time with each other. And we also have the tools now where they can stay connected remotely. So I think it's quite the petri dish you assemble and something will come out of it. I think that, uh, first of all, you already have the critical mass with some great people. So if you're building a new business or a new nonprofit, um, it's, it's a great coordination point to find other like-minded people. Uh, it's good to get to New Zealand because it gets you out of your normal comfort zone. Uh, and then you kind of have some shared experience together that builds trust very, very quickly. And when you're doing business or creating something, trust is really important. Um, and so just putting them into the same place and uh, having them go through shared new experiences um, is, is really interesting. Uh, even though this is, it's not really germane to, to my business, um, I found the close-up interaction with the Maori really interesting because we talk about uh, indigenous peoples uh, in the United States, but they're, they're kind of hidden away. 
Um, they're on reservations, they're heavily outnumbered. Um, one doesn't see them unless one seeks them out. And the level to which New Zealanders have integrated the Maori uh, and other Pacific Islanders, the, the indigenous peoples who are here, and the level to which they're willing to be open to welcome new people into their nation given the traumatic history of what happened here. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's another place in the world like it. It may be unique. So in that sense, just seeing that I think is a model. Uh, because uh, we're going through a phase right now, um, maybe it's social media, maybe it's the times, who knows, but it seems like all the men in the world are at war with all the women and all the uh, you know, whites are at war with the non-whites. Like if you go on Twitter today, <laughs> that's the impression you get. And it's, even though I'm sure that there are many things to be resolved here, um, seeing an older culture like the Maori have a place where you know, both men and women have power, but very different kinds of power that reflect who they are. And then watching them integrate into this society and this society integrate into them. I know it's not perfect. I don't, I don't know the history, but at least from here, it's educational. It seems good. Yeah, basically, I think that anyone who's coming as part of this program has to be prepared to contribute to New Zealand because New Zealand is extending you something pretty amazing, right? When the Maori show up and these people had their land taken from them and when they welcome you to their home, that's pretty amazing. I mean, there's, there must be a lot of pain behind that. Um, so in appreciation of that, you got to bring something to the game too. And I think everyone can contribute some combination of time, talent, and resources. Uh, time into the local community, and uh, if, you know, physically in the place, getting to know it. Uh, talent in terms of your unique attributes, insights, um, whatever you bring um, to the table, and resources. Some of us who are coming with big resources should contribute to local charities, the investment um, circuit over here. Um, has to be done in a way that is scalable and sustainable, but uh, you know, EHF is small today. It's what, like 150 uh, fellows, uh, maybe going to a couple of hundred. But I think when, you, when people look back in time and say, well, per new fellow who came in, the level of contribution, uh, I would be surprised if there's a single immigrant program in the world that would match it. Uh, I, also, I, I actually also think that at this point, EHF is a pretty exclusive club, <laughs> right? It's got, there's, a, there's a signaling benefit to it. There's a credentialing benefit to it. Uh, I've, I've looked at the numbers. The acceptance rates are quite low. And I know some very, very capable people who are not accepted. Um, so. Uh, you know, in that sense, this is a club that may not have you as a member. So if you apply, you're, you're, you're in pretty good company. Um, this is not the kind of club where just anyone can get in. This is a very intentionally crafted community. Um, so just if you do get in, you're going you're gonna to meet and connect with people that normally you would never be able to have, have the time and space to form an actual connection with. Uh, the, the quirky, challenging things were, I think, also still weirdly necessary. Um, like, I'm not a sit still and listen person, so I don't like sitting in a dome while someone gives long talks. Uh, on the other hand, if the team there hadn't worked tirelessly to break the ice, we would not have bonded. Um, I, to me, the staff was very impressive. The Maori people are very, very impressive. Um, if I were going to change one thing, I'd just spend more time outdoors and less indoors just because it's so beautiful here but I may have also picked a week when it didn't rain that much and I think other classes may have been here when it was raining more but I prefer more outdoor sessions more small group activities um, and kind of less indoor large group activities but overall um, I think the for you know one week the level of bonding that is achieved it's pretty amazing yeah I think for the government uh, the best thing it can possibly do is um, probably have a regulatorily friendly environment that allows some level of experimentation for early stage companies. Um, private sector, it's about technology education, having a technically literate workforce, um, having people trained in computers and uh, putting them in some kind of a central hub, whether it's Wellington or Auckland. Um, for the companies, uh, I think because thanks to the internet uh, and to, due to rising prices and cost of living in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, people are getting comfortable with this idea of having a small office in San Francisco and the main organization, say here, if there's access to talent. Um, and then I think over time, if there's a good technically literate workforce here, you could even see startups like Stripe or Square or Airbnb or Uber uh, putting up technology outposts here in New Zealand, um, which I think would also help create that ecosystem, that topsoil into which startups can eventually grow. Yeah, I, I think. Um, 
I'm happy to work with local people for crypto regulation, crypto conferences, uh, and helping make New Zealand one of the stops on the grand crypto tour. Um, and then I want to help EHF itself, the, the parent organization. It's easy to do outward things uh, for uh, the, the whole ecosystem, but I think EHF itself is really interesting because uh, from what I understand, it has 400 visas to bring in 400 great people who are going to make a difference. And I want to make sure that when we can show that that's working with the impact of very intentionally selecting those 400 people and tracking them, motivating them and so on. Uh, when we see what the impact is, any sensible government, and I'm sure other governments in the world will want to copy it, they'll be like, well, I want to do that with 4,000 people or 40,000 people, and how do I do that? Um, I want to make sure that the model is figured out properly. Uh, you know, I come from the private sector where we're used to accountability. We're used to things actually working, not just talking. Um, so I want to make sure that whatever comes out of EHF on the other side is quantifiable, trackable, uh, and can clearly be shown, uh, the, the benefit that it's had can clearly be shown. Doing the haka was definitely out of my comfort zone, but something I needed to do. <laughs> I feel like New Zealand is uh, one spark away from an economic forest fire. <laughs> Maybe that's the wrong analogy to use here, because <laughs> forest fires are a bad thing, but I mean in the sense that you, you can ignite something here. All the raw materials are here. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything really missing. I think this, it just needs that spark. Maybe EHF is that spark. Maybe regulation, deregulation in some key areas is that spark. Maybe just the internet enabling more remote working will create that spark. Um, but I don't think we're far. I'm not saying New Zealand's going to be Silicon Valley overnight, but it could be a place where a reasonable mid-sized technology industry starts thriving and growing. Um, and New Zealand becomes an exporter of technology.